Hey everyone, welcome back. Before we get started, I want to mention that these stories are very dark and disturbing. They range from the topics of murder, human trafficking, and mental illness. If you don't want to hear stories like that, you've been warned. If you have a story like this or any other story, you can send it at southerncannibal.com. Without any more interruptions, let's get started. And remember, to always, stay hungry. When I was 18, I had moved into my first apartment. I'm a female from the UK, by the way. My apartment block wasn't very high with only four levels, and I had stayed at the top. The bottom floor was a storage room, so people only lived on the three floors, and there were only three apartments on each floor, so it wasn't huge. Directly below me on the middle landing, a middle-aged couple lived there. The man had a business job in the city, and I knew that from having a quick chat with him once. His girlfriend stayed home a lot, but I didn't pay much attention to it, but it was something that I was aware of. Rumors began circulating that he was cheating on her, and I was inclined to believe it. He would stand and whisper into his phone and acted really odd when talking on his phone in public. I noticed that he started going outside every few hours to talk on his phone for like 40 minutes at a time, but it wasn't my business, and I didn't know for sure what he was up to, so I just stayed out of it. Well, the rumors turned out to be true, and one day he moved out. She, however, stayed in the apartment. I had a friend who was a real busybody and always knew the latest gossip. She claimed that they were planning on sorting things out, but that the girlfriend demanded some space. I'm not sure how true that is, though. I think it was around March of 2018, and I hadn't noticed anything out of the ordinary. I commuted to college, so I had to attend my classes, go to my part-time job, and just live my life. One day when I came home around 4.30 p.m., I saw that the street had cop cars, an ambulance, and a darn blue and black van. I went in and ascended the stairs, and before I even entered the building, a truly horrendous smell coated my lungs. I know that it's irritating when people say this, but I genuinely do not know how to describe the smell. I want to say that it was like a sweet mold, but even that doesn't sound right. It really is something you need to smell for yourself, because it's indescribable. It just smelled like death. As I got into the middle stairwell area, I saw that the couple below me's front door was open, and a lot of emergency professionals were surrounding the front door, as well as being inside her house. There was also police tape there, and a police officer blocked my view with his body when he saw me. The smell was pungent, and I knew it was coming from their apartment. When I got into my own apartment, I had called my mom because I was fearing the worst. She comforted me, and she told me to just stay at my place and look out the window to keep an eye on things. I ended up finding out via Facebook gossip that the lady in the apartment right below me had ended her own life. I'm not really sure what happened but she was apparently found in the bath after her boyfriend hadn't heard from her and he came to check on her. I don't know how long she had been in there deceased. I also didn't notice any insects, and no insects were in my apartment. I'm assuming that she hadn't been dead for very long. I know this story might not seem that scary, but for me it was horrible. It hurts my heart to think that that poor woman died alone in her bathtub. It also makes me so sad to think that she was so low that she ended her own life. Despite her boyfriend being trash for cheating, I still feel bad for him for being the one to discover her like that, and my heart goes out to everyone who loves her. It's just a really horrible situation. That smell really was truly indescribable. I've heard on crime shows that you can't describe the smell of a dead body, and you really can't. Nothing quite captures it. That smell lingered in the stairwell for days. I don't think it stayed for a month, but it took a long time to fully go away.
cleaners did come out and spent a long time scrubbing the whole stairwell, and every single floor as well. But like I said, the smell was just searing. Her boyfriend ended up going back to live there with another guy. I don't know if they were friends or something more, but I really felt bad for him living in the place that his ex passed away at. I suppose it was his decision, but it still made me feel bad for him and the other guy. I hope that woman is at peace now, and if anyone needs a sign to keep going on, please take this as your sign. There is nothing in this world that can't be fixed. Help is available, and you shouldn't cut your own life short. Life is worth living, and the bad times will not last forever. Stay strong and stay safe, everyone. And my heart goes out to anyone who's lost a loved one in this tragic way, as well to all of those who have struggled with suicidal thoughts or attempts. I'm glad you're still here in the world. Be safe, everyone. I'm a 22-year-old female from Oregon. This happened to me about a year ago. I was honestly unsure if I'd ever share this story because it's not very long and not necessarily the scariest. It is true though, and it genuinely freaked me out, so I suppose I'll share it. At the time, I had moved in with my best friend for a few months while I was in between places to live due to some personal stuff going on in my life. She had helped me get a job at a dairy mart, conveniently located right behind her apartment complex. It was only a 30 second walk, literally. I worked the closing shift around 4 p.m. to 11 p.m. and we were always scheduled in pairs, so nobody had to work alone. I have a little side story that I also want to add as to why this rule was in place. Although it doesn't have any relevance to my story, I wanted to mention it anyway. So, in the year 2000, there was a young woman that was murdered in that store's cooler by a robber. She was working all alone one night when this maniac decided to rob the store. She was stocking the cooler with her earbuds in and had no idea he was there until it was way too late. He shot and killed her in cold blood, robbing her of her life just so that he could rob a damn store. May that poor woman rest peacefully. And to that awfully sick man, karma's a bitch. I wish I could say I knew more details of that story, but I never figured out the names of them or what happened to the guy afterwards. I can only hope that the woman received her justice and that that evil man is locked up for a very, very long time, if not for life. Now I'll get on with my own story. My coworker, whom I'll refer to as Buck, and I were scheduled to close together on a Saturday night. The whole day went by as normal up until the last hour of our shift. At around 10 p.m., a guy came in and bought a pack of cigarettes. Buck and I exchanged a look as this guy reeked of alcohol and was very visibly drunk. I gave him his smokes, and once he was outside, my coworker and I discussed calling the cops on him for drinking and driving, but he had never pulled out of the parking lot. A little confused by his loitering, we took note of his license plate and waited for him to leave. Now, I know what you're all thinking. Why didn't we make the call immediately as soon as he left the store? I'm not really sure, honestly, but that was definitely a mistake on our part. We were both a little hesitant, as we've never come across this situation before. Anyway, he sat outside for about 15 minutes, then came back inside and proceeded to tell us how he lost his keys, and had also asked if we'd seen them inside the store anywhere. Buck and I took a look around, but we didn't find them. Once we told him that his keys were definitely not anywhere in the store, he started flipping the fuck out and became very aggressive. He began cursing us out, throwing shit around the store, and actually accusing us of stealing his keys from him so he couldn't drive away. We never mentioned anything to the guy about knowing he was drunk and that he shouldn't be driving. So, this guy was basically telling on himself at this point. Buck then hurriedly motions for me to go to the back of the store to call the police while he tries to de-escalate the situation. This is when I felt very dumb for not making the call sooner. I ran to the back, locked myself in the office, and I made the call. 
I then heard a loud shatter of glass then breaking, and I had rushed to go see if Buck was okay. When I got back to the front of the store, the guy was no longer inside, and Buck screamed for me to help him to make sure all the doors and drive through window were locked. The glass shattering noise I heard was from the guy smashing a cooler door into pieces. At this point, I had called my best friend to tell her the situation, and she told me she'd be there at the store in a few to talk to us and to help me calm down. She said that she wanted to try talking to the guy, but I warned her not to do that, that the cops are on their way, and to just pull up to the drive through window to talk. Thankfully, the guy was so out of it that he didn't even notice her when she pulled up, and we then talked to her for a bit, keeping an eye on the guy until the cops arrived just a few minutes later. The guy was arrested, obviously. Then Buck and I were questioned, and my best friend as well. I remember that his truck sat in our lot for a couple of days after this incident before it finally got towed away. I'm not quite sure how long the guy was in jail for, but knowing how America's justice system works, it was probably only for a few days. I ended up quitting this job a month or two later, not solely because of this incident, but it just made me realize that I didn't want to work customer service anymore, and I just didn't want to have to have another encounter like that ever again. I now work at a warehouse where I no longer have to deal with any customers. If any of you listening work in this field, please be careful out there. If your job requires you to work the night shift by yourself, I would really advise you please talk to your managers and owners so that you don't have to, or just get a different job if they refuse. I feel like this rule should be required everywhere that you work, especially customer service. But unfortunately, that's just not always the case. I was 23 when this happened. I was walking alone in the woods one late night, and I was walking for about a mile when my right foot hit something on the ground. It had felt like a person laying there, so in a panic, I then said out loud, Oh my god, I'm so sorry. I didn't see you there, man. Are you okay? But there was no response, so I asked again, and still no response. So I had pulled out my phone and turned on my flashlight to get a better view of the person. When I shined my flashlight there, what I saw made me scream very loud, and I mean very loud. The person laying there was a guy, and he had blood and stab wounds all over his stomach and his chest. This guy really looked like he had been stabbed a ton of times. Just the sheer sight of it literally made me sick to my stomach. I threw up so much and so hard that I felt like I was going to faint. After I was done vomiting, I called 911 and told them what I saw and to hurry. They showed up within about 10 minutes. After they arrived, I told the police and paramedics everything and I showed them the body. As you can all imagine, they took away the body in a body bag. I ended up going with the paramedics of the hospital to give more details since I was a witness. They said that he was apparently stabbed 12 times, 6 times in the chest, and 6 times in the stomach. Unfortunately, the guy was killed from the stabs which caused massive blood loss. I never did know the guy by the way, so as far as I know he was just some random John Doe. I couldn't sleep for three days after that, and to this day, I still can't get that horrifying image of the guy out of my head, and it still gives me nightmares. I now have bad PTSD from that night, and now I'm terrified to go walking at night alone. How the hell could someone do that to this guy? In the mid-2000s, my mother, suffering from severe mental illness, had many extreme outbursts and episodes. In fact, that entire decade which was my childhood was defined by such dramatic events. This is only one of many. My mother suffers from the most severe case of schizoaffective disorder you've ever seen. It's basically a combination between bipolar and schizophrenia, making it far worse than either illness alone. Imagine the kind of unpredictable homeless person you see talking to themselves and twitching on the sidewalk in Oakland or Skid Row, 
and you basically have an idea of what my mom's like. Her illness was mainly induced by meth and paranoia. Before I get into the story, I will mention that I was also the author of the drug-related story that Southern Cannibal narrated a few months back, where I had to fight off a tweaker with a cookie jar when I was 18. You can find me in the comments by my channel name, Sober Cat Boy. In this story, I'll refer to myself as C, and the rest of the names have been changed. On a sunny day in 2005, my grandparents whom I lived with had received a call from my mom's concerned boyfriend, James. I was only nine years old, but no stranger to the terror of witnessing psychotic episodes and the unpredictability that came with them. I listened to my grandparents discuss in low tones the situation at hand. James was at his wit's end. Nothing he did could get my mom to react or even move a muscle. She had been seated in the passenger seat of her old beat-up car for nearly two days, refusing to eat, drink, or even look at him. As I listened, concern churned my stomach. Nothing like this had ever happened before. Even though some terrible episodes had taken place before, Mom had never ceased to surprise us with her unpredictable nature. My grandparents and I immediately hopped in the van and made the 30-minute drive to the moldy, sagging trailer deep in the dark shade of the Red Woods. We pulled off to the side of a busy main road next to the trailer. Looking out the window to my right, I could see my mom in her parked car directly across the street. I only had a profile view from this angle, but it was clear that her eyes were bugging out. She sat completely without motion, tightly gripping the steering wheel. My grandparents stepped out to speak with James for a while as I sat in the car. Out of all my mom's boyfriends, James was my favorite. He was an alcoholic who had racked up DUIs and public intoxication charges, but he was still more mentally stable than any of the boyfriends I'd known before or since. He was a red-haired Celtic pagan metalhead who had taught me how to use LimeWire to download songs to a cheap MP3 player. I never once saw him get angry, and he sparked off a lifelong love of Celtic paganism in me. So far, he was handling the situation very well. James had told us how he tried to coax her out or get her to eat or drink, yet she remained stiff as a corpse. But we had a strong feeling she wasn't dead. Perhaps her consciousness was fully immersed within her mind in a dream world. After about 20 minutes of listening to repetitive conversation, the action started. My grandpa made his way across the street to approach my mom's cracked window. Grandma and I approached and watched from a short distance as he then knocked on the driver's side window. He desperately called to her, trying to get her attention. She didn't react. As I took a closer look at my mom, it had really saddened me to see how far she had fallen. She was once a beautiful brown-eyed woman with tan skin and long wavy bronze hair with natural highlights. Now greasy makeup smeared her face. She had oversized fake eyelashes, one hanging half off, and long dirty acrylic fingernails with glitter nail polish. She had shaved her head and eyebrows when I was seven while under the spell of a chronic delusion that she was Britney Spears or Paris Hilton. Now her hair had grown out a bit. Around a year before, she had started dyeing it bleach blonde, drawing in lines for her eyebrows, and constantly wearing blue contact lenses. She wore those blue lenses so much that her eyes suffered from infections, giving her a continuous bloodshot look. I'm skinny and I have big tits. I have blonde hair and blue eyes. She would repeat to herself in front of the mirror dozens of times a day. She would say this as her mantra, along with other base and carnal utterances so vile, demonic, and obscene that they permanently altered how I value human life to this very day. At that moment, as I looked upon her in that car, her decay and descent was full on display. She had gained significant weight, and her skin looked unhealthy. Her eyes were red and disassociated. Her hair was dirty and matted. She wore a bright pink jacket with fake pink fur lining the collar and lapels, but the brightness was obscured by the brown sheen and assorted debris caked into the synthetic fibers. 
My mom was once an accomplished ballerina who had graduated from New York University. We had played board games together, and I had spent at least one Christmas at her apartment in town. She was a loving mother, for the most part, until something changed in her. Sure, there were episodes occasionally when I was under seven years old, but something had happened around 2004. She snapped. The meth caught up with her genetic predispositions. The shady guys in New York had convinced her to use it, along with bulimia, you know, to help her stay thin and meet their unachievable standards. Now we, her family, were all paying the price. Either her medication wasn't working, or she wasn't taking it. Probably a little of both. Tears coursed down my grandma's eyes as I stuck to her side. Grandpa crossed the street to enter the trailer as we watched the car. He then emerged with crackers and a glass of water. He returned to her window, presenting what was in his hands and inviting her to open up. You need to eat and have some water, Lena. His words took on a stricter tone. Lena, open this door and drink this right now or you're gonna get it. He barked a few more orders before his desperation overtook him. His anger then turned into an emotional wail. Please eat and drink, Lena! His tears flowed. Lena, please snap out of it! My grandma, who was even more emotional, moved up beside him, comforting him. I come from an emotional family with some Italian mannerisms, and my grandma has always been even more emotional than my grandpa was. Her silent tears flowed twice as strong, and in her soft, quivering voice, she begged my mother to come to her senses. All to no avail. Grandpa kneeled on the gravel shoulder where my mom was parked, and we all began to pray. Dear Lord, please free Lena from whatever demon has taken over her. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Several hours had passed without me even realizing it. All that time spent talking to James, formulating, pleading, and praying seemed to fly by in a haze of dissociation. After our prayer, we had made our way back into our car and began heading home to plan. The whole experience had shaken me, but what I didn't know is that what I saw that day was like Disneyland compared to what I would later witness that night. The next few hours spent back at home were also a blur in my mind. I probably blocked everything out by playing Super Mario Bros. 3. Eventually, we got another call from James. She was still in the car, and it was getting dark. Grandpa made the tough decision to have us drive back over there at night and bring her back to our house one way or another. When we arrived at the trailer, twilight had fallen, shrouding the area with the midnight shade of the redwood canopy. Black darkness was quickly upon us. Grandpa exited the car, leaving Grandma and I behind to wait. We watched him coax and beg and plead until his voice rose in volume and lost all patience. I'm giving you one more chance! He growled. I saw no sign of reaction from my mom. Grandpa threw his hands up, made his way back to the van, and requested that Grandma get in the driver's seat and I sit in the front passenger seat. I wondered if he was planning on dragging her out and into the back of the van. He approached mom's window once more, this time raising his voice significantly. You better snap out of it and get out of that car or I'll make you. Grandpa tried a few other vague threats to get her to move. You have three seconds to get out of that car, Lena, or I'm breaking in. He counted down as he made his way to the passenger side window which was rolled up. With the countdown ended, he let out a power cry and broke in the window with a few bashes of his multi-tool. He reached in and opened the door before crawling in. At this point, all I could see was their silhouettes as Grandpa reached over to my mom to pull into the passenger seat. My grandma put a gentle hand on my arm to comfort me as the events unfurled. Suddenly, my grandma's grip tightened on my arm. Mom and reanimated, bursting into a torrent of furious flailing. Deep guttural moans and supernatural screams tore through the layers of glass from her car to ours. 
almost as loud as the powerful roar coming from Grandpa to dominate her into submission. But with all his mighty rage, Mom still put up an unnatural resistance. Blows were flung back and forth. Mom hit Grandpa as hard as she could with an astounding speed, and Grandpa hit back, slow but heavy. Shadows of bald fists accompanied the screams and my Nana's sobs. I was terrified, but I was paralyzed with enchantment. I couldn't look away. When Grandpa got her in the passenger seat, he ran out and then entered the driver's seat. The melee continued as he started the car and began driving, still fending off blows and delivering his own. Grandma followed in the van close behind as we made the difficult 30-minute journey home through the dark woods and winding roads. Through the headlights, I watched the brawl go on like the shadow puppet show from hell. Their car weaved and swayed across the road, frequently swerving into oncoming lanes as Grandpa struggled to maintain control. As we trailed them in our van, Grandma spoke through her tears. They're going to be okay, see? They're going to be okay. We just have to pray. Pray with me, see? And as we helplessly watched the danger before us through shivering tears, we prayed. We prayed over and over again. Dear God, please deliver them home safely. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. After the longest drive of my life, God showed mercy and delivered us home safely. Grandpa dragged Mom out of the car. She still resisted, attempting to push, make herself into a dead weight, kick and scream all the way into the house. He pulled her toward the upstairs room, shoved her inside, and roared at the top of his lungs. Now you stay in here for the rest of the night. And if you touch anything, or if I hear a single peep out of you, I'm going to come right in here and wring your neck. As harsh as Papa was, we loved him for what he did. His old-fashioned ways protected us. Mom didn't make a single peep for the rest of the night. She was a terror and a menace. And if I was him, I probably wouldn't have put myself at risk in that way. I would have just left her in that car to rot. For my mom, it was a long road to recovery, which never truly came. Shortly after that event, she ended up in a mental hospital where she spent the better part of a year. She would spend the next few years in and out of that hospital due to various other episodes. Sometimes things would get better, then they would get worse, then better again. But she never got back to the way she was before 2004. Things improved for me a bit when I was in high school and she lived elsewhere, but she moved back in after I graduated. Her episodes got really bad again in 2017 and 2018, when Grandpa was dying of cancer. But I'll save that story for the next time. It seems as if her medication either rarely works or she just doesn't take it. She also hasn't held a job in over a decade and never got healthy again. Her teeth have fallen out, she doesn't take care of herself, and she still lives with Grandma. And she's overall a massive burden that I wish the government would take off our shoulders. I have other stories I can share in the future. You can all find me in the comments as Sober Cat Boy. The story is about the time that I almost got kidnapped and trafficked. It really changed the way I view the world and the people around me. So without further ado, here it is. My family and I decided to go to Savannah, Georgia this year on vacation. I used to live in Savannah as a kid and booked a hotel close to my old neighborhood. I felt safe because I was familiar with the area, but oh boy how I was wrong. We arrived at the hotel without any problems and started to settle in. My husband decided that he wanted to go look around a little bit since there were thick woods behind the hotel separated by an eight foot high privacy fence. He found a rotted hole in the fence and proceeded to go through it before the manager of the hotel noticed and stopped him. The manager then told my husband it was extremely dangerous to even get close to the fence, let alone go into the woods behind it. When my husband asked why, the manager then told my husband that there was a homeless camp located right over the fence and that there had been an individual found murdered 
specifically decapitated the day before. The homeless camp was known to be very violent and where less than desirable people lived. I know what everyone else is thinking. Why didn't we just leave and book another hotel? Well, I really wish it was that easy, but trying to take a family of four on vacation on a budget is hard. We didn't have the money to book another hotel, and we weren't able to get a refund for the days we booked. Trust me, we tried. We figured that we would still try to make the best of it since we only get to go on vacation once a year. We talked about it, and we agreed that we would keep the deadbolt on the door locked at all times, travel in pairs if we had to leave the room for some reason, and we also carried our 9mm pistol on our side whenever we went from the truck to the room. All seemed to be going smoothly, and all of us were having a really great time until the second night we were there. We had went to Tybee Island and spent the entire day at the beach. Needless to say, the kids were really exhausted when we arrived back at the room, so they both fell into a deep sleep as soon as their heads hit the pillow. My husband said that he wanted to take a shower. I smoked cigarettes and I wanted to step out and smoke since our room was non-smoking. I grabbed a keycard in my smokes and made my way out to the front of the building to the smoking area. It had started to pour in rain, so I decided to just stay close to the hotel doors to stay dry. I lit up a cigarette and propped myself up on a stone pillar, looking out into the now dark sky. I thought I was safe standing at the front of the building, but boy was I wrong. As I was standing there, I saw the manager of the hotel come up walking to go inside, so I said, Hey, you're the manager, right? You spoke with my husband yesterday. Thank you for looking after him. He tends to wander around in new places. He said that it was no problem and that he tries to look out for the unsuspecting tourists that don't necessarily know about the area. I told him how I was from the area, but it had been many years since I lived there and that it had drastically changed for the worse over the years. It really wasn't like that when I was a kid, I told him. He was super friendly, and before I knew it, he had me laughing till my cheeks were hurting. Now, I can honestly say that I should have went back to my room after I finished the first cigarette, but he had my attention, so I lit up yet another smoke. By this time, I had been outside for around 10 minutes, so I'm standing there talking away to the manager when a group of about six Hispanic men walk up and stood around eight feet from the manager and I. Neither of us thought anything of it at first. I don't speak Spanish, so I didn't know what they were saying. I knew that they were staring at me and talking amongst themselves, but I get this a lot. So I continue smoking my cigarette and talking to the manager when the manager gets a strange look on his face. He didn't say anything, and I didn't know him well enough to ask what was wrong. But just then... The six guys walk into the rain and out of view. The manager opened his mouth to say something when a brand new white F-150 Ford with blacked out windows skidded to stop right in front of us. I could hear what sounded like a car full of men speaking in Spanish through a crack in the window. I then felt a hand on my shoulder. It was the manager. He told me that I had to get back to my room right away and proceeded to basically shove me into the hotel lobby. Now, you need to remember that this happened in the span of about 30 seconds. Once we were standing in the lobby, I heard the white truck pull out of the hotel parking lot like a bat out of hell. The manager then insisted on walking me back to my room. While we were walking, the manager then told me what the six guys were saying. What they failed to realize is though I may not have been able to understand them, the manager, however, could speak Spanish and he understood every word they said. This is what he told me. He said that the guys were talking about waiting for him to walk off and leave me alone so that they could take me. They said that I was perfect and would fetch a good price. When the manager refused to leave, they got in their truck and were going to just jump out and rush me right there in front of the hotel doors. Their exact words were, just grab her. I asked the manager why he didn't just say something or try to get my attention while we were standing there. 
He said that he didn't want to tip them off that he knew what they were planning. He was worried that they might have tried to take me right then and there. Just one guy and one five foot tall girl wouldn't be much against six fully grown men. Many have asked me why I didn't have my 9mm on me while outside alone at dark after what we had learned from the first day there. My answer is that I don't have a concealed carry license for the state of Georgia. The state I live in doesn't even require a concealed carry license to pack protection. I couldn't just walk around a hotel with a gun strapped to my hip, but I wish I had and I never go anywhere without it again. The rain actually played a significant role in my survival. Let me elaborate for you. The actual smoking area for the hotel was across the parking lot near an alleyway. The fact that it was raining that night stopped me from going into a dark alley to have a smoke. If I had, the manager would have never saw me and never came up to talk to me, leaving me completely at the mercy of six men and whatever they had planned for me. I made it back to my room safely thanks to the manager who watched out for me when he didn't have to. I owe my life to him. If it hadn't been for him, I would have ended up being just another missing woman that her family never knew what became of her. That day changed my life, and I think about it almost daily. I consider myself to have been extremely lucky to survive that night. Since then, I'm constantly on guard and aware of my surroundings. So if I can give any advice to women on vacation or in an unfamiliar place, know that there is safety in numbers. Don't do what I did. Not everyone will be as lucky as I was. Hey everyone, I hope you all enjoyed these stories. If you ever want to submit your own, you can do so at southerncannibal.com. Have a good night everyone. And remember, to always, stay home.